I'm Jane Hansen. This week in the arena, for more than two decades, the Catholic Church has grappled with a series of clergy sexual abuse scandals and lawsuits. The cases have cost an estimated $2 billion in settlements and have shaken the faith of many of the Church's members worldwide. And the story continues. Joining us now is Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal Pathios.com, and Grant Galicia. Associate Editor of Commonwealth Magazine. Thank you all for being here to discuss this. And as you know, this is a subject that continues. We continue to talk about it. I'm curious, Elizabeth, what do people at Pathios, at the Catholic Portal, what do they continue to say about it? Um, you know, I think there's a deep regret, deep sadness, and I think there's a sense of people are just so tired of talking about it, and yet it's like death by a thousand cuts. It keeps coming and coming, and it's going to keep coming for probably decades until many priests are gone. Uh, and it's, it's wearying mm -hmm. and always upsetting, and it never, it never gets to a point where it's just, it, it's more than a dull ache. It's, it's always going to be a sharp pain. Grant, from your journalistic viewpoint, there's, it's, to me, it seems that there's just continues to be another story, another story, another story. Is that your viewpoint? Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the problems is uh, just the Catholic in the pew. There, there's a there's a drip, drip, drip. You know, one story here, another story there, another story, and it has a cumulative, crushing effect. Uh, there there's a sense among Common Wheels readers uh, that the bishops have still don't get it. And so when you see a, a recent round of stories about um, priests in Philly, uh, supposedly 37 are being investigated right now, ones who are currently in ministry, Catholic parents wonder, well, are my kids safe? Mm -hmm. The other problem with that, though, is that you also have priests who are kind of grouped into these uh, big examinations who are perfectly innocent, but they're all, uh, we're almost presuming them guilty because we're, we're so fed up with it and and it's like a pox on all of them. Do you feel that way Monsignor that there's that there's a, a, a grouping that sometimes may mean that as a person who wears a collar that sometimes you can be suspected of things that are not absolutely not true? In the United States in an annual basis over 700,000 children are abused and when you consider that 700,000 are abused. That's violence in the home. That goes all sorts of violence. Ten percent of them are victims of sexual abuse. Uh, when you consider that in the last year uh, the, there were 390 somewhat incidences of abuse reported uh, that involved cl clergy, Catholic clergy, six of them involved children, children today. The others were all historical cases. So to me, when I take a look at it, is your question is, is, do I feel like we're unfairly targeted? I think that because of the systems of the Catholic Church and because, of, uh, because we're seen as a centralized, uh, centralized institution, uh, it's, this problem is easily discussed uh, by looking at the church. But from my point of view, I think that one of the, one of the problems here is, is that we're not looking at the broader problem of sexual abuse of children, the expo sexual exploitation of children. And the Catholic Church has conveniently become the epicenter of this discussion, but it isn't. Uh, but the, the discussion extends far, far beyond the Catholic Church, and we're unwilling to talk about it in the military, in our school system, and every place else. That's not meant to be a deflection, because as Grant identified, there are some real questions in terms of how this has question, how this has been dealt with in the past, how it's continuing to be dealt with uh, today. But that being said, I think that the one institution that is seeking to address this in a very public way that is under the microscope of, of public scrutiny is the Catholic Church. I don't think there's really any question about that. No, but it's not as though the Church came to that point of view on its own. I mean, I, it was, I it was under that. an enormous amount of pressure. And, and while it's true that, obviously, there's much more abuse that goes on outside the Church than inside, when you look at the, at the, at the John Jay report, roughly 4% of Catholic clergy during between 1950 and 2002 were accused. And according to the data in the, in the wider culture, that's about double. So that's why Catholics are, that, that's what worries Catholics. That's what worries the wider public. It, is there, probably not today, but why? And there will be an, another study that's, that's coming out soon, but why? Why, why was it 4%? Those, those percentages are consistent along professions that deal with 
uh, young people. And so th that percentage would be consistent with teachers and so, f and, and so forth. But the difference is that this is the church and, and people yeah. can look at right. teachers or scout leaders or you know, even the rabbi and say, uh, you know, they're just like you and me. We hold our priests to a higher standard, whether that's fair or not. The, you know, you're ordained the, the, apostolically. The, 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 there's no question about it. Listen, I, I think that Catholics, we should hold our clergy to a higher standard. I, 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 we should hold ourselves to a higher standard, and Catholics should hold their clergy to a, to a very high standard. So that should be the case. What's happening here, though, is the general public is holding the Catholic clergy to a different standard. And just to Grant's point on the John Jay study, which I think is really important. I mean, the Catholic Church became the epicenter in 2002 of a sexual abuse scandal, and there was a flood, a flood of allegations against clergy uh, that came forward. So a lot of these cases were not known in the past. There were a lot of new cases that came forward in 2002. But new cases that came forward, but that were they from happened, a long yeah, time that ago. That happened a long, long time ago. Right. Now, now here's the because reason why again, did that happen. Because victims had the courage to come forward. Which is great, which is exactly right. what should happen. I mean, hopefully this was a moment that could be a catharsis, a healing, that there's, the people could get the help they need. The thing is, is that that has not happened in other institutions. So Grant points to a statistic of 4% of clergy. Well, that's because for, for basically six months, and really, if you want to think about it, for almost 10 years now, the Catholic, the Catholic clergy have been the subject of a constant barrage of articles. So, so people who have been abused in church institutions can very easily, and the church has made it very easy for them to come forward. That has not happened in our public entities and in other, in other charities. So you're suggesting that needs to happen. I just want to talk about what is actually in the news, the latest news. You referred to what's going on in Philadelphia. Can you take that a little bit further? Sure. Uh, a grand jury uh, investigation produced a, uh, a, a report that eventually indicted the uh, Secretary for Clergy, the Secretary for Clergy, which is the first time that someone in the church hierarchy has actually been indicted. Um, there, there, were, there was a teacher, I, b I believe, and, and two priests. Yeah. I think that it's very important to note, and anybody who has dealt with the criminal justice system knows, that first, the, uh, the barrier to being indicted uh, is very low that it is very easy to be indicted. Basically in front of a grand jury. Before a grand sure. jury. The standard of evidence is very low. Which it is took it took this grand it took this it took this the district attorney in Philadelphia ten years, ten years to, to cross a very forward. minimal threshold. So one can't wonder is this is what what's really motivating this sort of uh, this sort of prosecution. That would be the first thing I would say. Now that doesn't mean that there are not legitimate cases uh, that that should be discussed. But the question is is that this guy is being indicted Ten years after the fact, with a very minimal threshold, raises questions for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's also talk about there. There were some stories uh, recently about Ireland and a ceremony that actually took place that involved the washing of the feet of some victims of sexual abuse. Can you tell me about that story? Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston. I think it really is fitting, right? Because Boston was the epicenter of the child sexual abuse case in, in the United States. And uh, and certainly his leadership on that issue uh, from when he was in Falls River uh, and then in Palm Beach. I mean, he, he really has been a person who's been intimately involved in these issues. Uh, it's interesting, his visitation of the Irish church and really the place, the starting point is, is people who've been hurt like clergy because we're supposed to be instruments of God's love. And what has happened here is that priests have become instruments of God's alienation from God's love. And that's really the the horror scene. So what the Archbishop's visit, the Cardinal's visitation of Ireland, I think, can be an opportunity for real healing and reconciliation. But what they did was the washing of the feet, just as we do um, on, Holy Thursday. on Holy Thursday. And so it's a tradition that's really about helping in a purification process in a certain sense. Well, it's a very powerful symbol. Yeah. When the Archbishop of Dublin mm -hmm. and the Archbishop of Boston come together and wash the feet of victims. I think that, I mean, now that, that's something that the Catholic Church does well, ritual. We haven't seen much of that here in the States. We, we've seen it, in, in, but we haven't seen a, a major event like that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, I think Catholics look to, look to the, the tragic situation in, in uh, Ireland and they say, well, that church is suffering immensely. And these two bishops, one, one from Boston, one local, they get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, that, you know, the interesting thing about the washing of the feet is a question about servanthood, right? That you have to let me be your servant. And, you know, the problem with the sexual abuse scandal in Ireland, I think, is, is that in the last century, certainly since uh, the Irish Republic was established by Eamon de Valera, the church was not in a position of servanthood. It was in a position of power, and that wielded that power sometimes in a way that was 
was to the detriment of people, or at least people saw it. And so it was a powerful historical symbol for the people of Ireland who saw the church and the parish priest and and living in not in a a humble penitential way as they had pre uh, the the previous to the Republic. They saw them in positions of power. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to continue this discussion in just a moment. Remember, you can weigh in on this discussion anytime by going to our website at netny.net backslash in the arena and click on enter the arena and we welcome your questions and comments. We'll be right back. Welcome back as we continue our discussion on the sex abuse in the church. And I want to talk with you a second, Monsignor, about um, you've recently had a German bishop that has been here visiting and talking about the sex abuse scandal in Germany, which, of course, the Pope is German, so um, it's a very delicate issue. Not that it's never delicate, but um, the conversation you had with that that has been taking place here is really him looking for guidance from how the U.S. has dealt with yeah, well, I mean, he's speaking, he, he was here for a lot of other reasons in right. terms of looking at communications models and that sort of thing. So, so that's, a, he was speaking about a lot of other things, but he, as he discussed on, uh, as he discussed on nightly news program when he was uh, in an interview, basically I think that he was looking to kind of say what has been the experience of the American church and what has the American church learned. And I think one of the uh, important experiences uh, that we had is a report that's going to be released, the third part of a report that's going to be released soon is the John Jay report. I mean, the Catholic church really to show its seriousness on this issue is we uh, opened up all our own records uh, and presented them to social scientists to say, put, let's get the sense of the problem, the causes of this problem, the context for this problem. And, and, and really, no other institution has done that. So I, I think that there is clearly on the part of the Catholic Church a sense of why did this happen in our institution? Because the same question that's being asked of you, you know, all of you who are Catholic, right? How could this happen? Are my children safe in the Catholic Church? These are the questions that bishops are asking too, because we're all mystified by how this could happen. Now, maybe you could say there are very logical reasons, right? Priests did horrible things, and sometimes those horrible things were not addressed in an immediate fashion, a way that protected children. I think we could all say that. But but what was the cultural context for that setup? How did how was it allowed? What was to occur? the cultural context? Well, there was there were, there were a lot of. I mean, we're going to see from this report, right, that it will kind of indicate what what it was. So so we don't have all the facts now. But my suspicion is is that that this was a time of great upheaval in the Catholic Church. You know, it's it's a classic epidemic. I mean, it's a bell curve. You can see how the epidemic had a beginning, at a high point, and an end. And I suspect it had something to do with the broader culture. And I got to tell you, and the, Jen, it goes back to the point that I was trying to make earlier. I think that there is the shame of the Catholic Church and the pain that has been experienced in the Catholic Church and by Catholics. I mean, it can have a redemptive effect in that if this problem, which we have experienced and to our shame, has been made public in a way that other people who have been dealing with abuse, and 80% of these cases of abuse happen in the home, if people can come forward and find some sense of healing, I think then, you know, then some good has come from evil. And that's the message, that's the ultimate Christian message. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about this, this German bishop, and, and we've just been speaking about what's happened in Ireland, I almost get the sense that uh, that coming from the Vatican, when this initial problems were reported here in the U.S., the initial cases, that it was kind of like, oh, that's an American problem, that's them doing something, and now we're seeing it across all of Europe. That, that was a common thing that you would hear from Vatican officials. Uh, this is this is America. That it is a consumerist society. It's a sexualized society. It's not surprising that there would be an epidemic of abuse because there's a kind of perversion that's endemic to the secular American culture. So it was. I think it was very hard for people in Rome to grasp that the abuse crisis hit home. I mean, it, it's in. It was in Germany. It was in the Netherlands. It's in Ireland. It's but in France. But you know Fran- what's interesting about that? You know what's interesting about that is that you say it's hard that it, it hit home like that. But you see, this shows you. This goes to the cultural context, right? Because these are people who are in positions of leadership, so they would have known theoretically 
about the uh, issue. So what was the blindness? And my suspicion is, is uh, it goes to the point of what is the purpose of a priest, right? And a bishop to that point is they typically see themselves in a posture of reconciliation. And I think that in some sense that what they fail to recognize is that they also had a different responsibility. And that was the responsibility of governance in the church. And I think that that problem, that, that bifurcation happened at a very specific point in the life of the church. And I think that, again, it contributed to the bell curve. I think that that has, that, that has uh, in some sense, diminished today. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the proactive steps that the church has taken, including this program called Virtus. Can you describe it? Well, well I think Virtus has got to be seen in a, bro in a broader context, right? So what is, what's the process right now? Anybody who is a volunteer in the Catholic Church has to undergo a background, a background screening, right? So everyone goes undergoes a background screening. Everyone, after they've undergone a background screening, has to go through a, uh, a training program to ensure that they're aware of their surroundings and they're aware, aware of the surroundings of other adults. In other words, that they're sensitized not to put a child in danger and they're to be aware of the situations when other adults might put a child into danger. So those are two very big steps. The third thing is, is there's a program called Child Lures where young people are made to, are, are brought to a sort of awareness of when adults might put them in uncomfortable positions. So, I mean, there are three different elements to what has taken place here. In any church today, uh, in, in the Diocese of Brooklyn and other places, there are reporting numbers so that you don't bring your report of abuse to the church, right? You bring it to an outside agency because we recognize that sometimes when it was brought internally, it was mishandled, right? So, uh, so we seek to bring these reporting of, of these crimes outside the church. So I think that the, the church today is really seeking uh, to address this problem uh, that uh, that has been so painful. You do, you know, the blogging. You're really involved in the Catholic community. You know how people are thinking. Do you get the sense from people that they think these are the right steps to be taking? I think that people are encouraged. I don't know if they're convinced. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I'd like to get back to something that Karen was just talking about because it made me very sad to think that this is more, I mean, we have this laser-like focus on the church in America and the church in Europe now, but really what this is speaking to is a brokenness of the human condition itself. And these things are not new. They didn't just start happening 30 years ago, not in the church and not among humanity. This has always been the case, that people will exploit the vulnerable and, and the people they can't exploit. And I think one of the things that we're losing sight of here is that you're talking about this bell curve, you're talking about larger cultural issues. Well, I mean, I can remember my mother telling me how in 1925, 1930, there was no such thing as you reported a, a, a cop, you went to running to a cop if somebody smacked a kid. You know, and in the 60s and 70s, there were really no laws speaking to the sexual abuse of children. That really didn't come up until the 80s and 90s. And even then, if you think back, mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s, when the bishops were starting to look at this and, and there were whispers, what did they do? They went outside of the church. They went outside of the scope of their expertise, and they went to the psychiatric community, which back then said pedophilia, pederasty, is treatable. A couple of therapy sessions, a little bit of dopamine, they're back on the job. And the bishops said, okay, we'll do that. And they were wrong to do it. I think the biggest problem that the bishops made was that they didn't go back to what their own scope was, which is the scriptures. Well, what I think, Elizabeth, what I think the mistake was, was they looked at pedophilia, pederasts, as sinners and as sin. What they failed to recognize is something you said, which is really important. They didn't see it as a crime. <laughs> and I think that that's been the big cultural and nobody shift. Understood. When nobody you see understood it as a, the rate of recidivism. That's right. But I mean, it's a difference in terms of a crime was committed. And so when a crime is committed, the police are informed, the district attorney prosecutes, and a person goes to right. jail. But then that, remember, that was the, the culture, failure. again, the culture didn't really define yeah, right. this as a crime. No, because if you get, again, 80% of these, again, 80% of these, 80% of these sorts of incidents take place in homes, right? And so you can see how difficult it is to see it as a crime when it's a father or a stepfather or an uncle or whatever it might be. I, I can tell you that when I was a child, uh, when I was in Catholic school in the 80s and, and 90s, we knew that there was such a thing as a priest who could abuse you. We didn't, we thought of it as a crime. It was not, you know, it wasn't, it was something we actually joked about in a very morbid way. You know, watch out for this guy, watch right. out for that guy. Right, don't be but, alone with so and so. But, and, and I think, and just if I could just say, I think, you know, rape is, has always been a crime. 
I mean, it's not. It's not. But how people, how children Mom. were perceived with the, within the law was always Great. very. And different. I think that the, the, the other thing is is when we no no no, no. Ra raping, raping a child a has it's always it's been it's illegal. It is. It is. It is. I'm There's, talking about molestation. But, but I'm talking about. about the, well, the, that is the, the, that right. is that's a central point here, though, and that that often gets overlooked is that the vast majority of these cases, and I'm sure you're familiar with the John Jay, were not rape; uh, they were abuse, they were they were molestation, they were inappropriate touching and inappropriate circumstances. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the same thing that you're describing. And we are going to take a break. We'll be continue our discussion on this important issue of sex abuse in the church in just a moment. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation on sex abuse in the church, we are joined once again by Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal at Pathios.com, and Grant Galicho, Associate Editor of Commonweal Magazine. So the one part of this we haven't yet touched on is the money, and of course I think everybody was reeling still with a huge settlement in Los Angeles and the bankruptcy cases around the country. I'm just wondering, not only is it having to, to pay for the settlements, but it's how many people are no longer giving money to the church because of all of this. I, don't, I actually don't think it's been, I think there was, there was a big drop off after the O2 scandal broke. Uh, and I mean, especially in Boston, there was that they, they lost and probably haven't gotten back a lot of money. That, that, that you know, people just stopped giving. Mm -hmm. uh, but ar around the country, there actually hasn't been a big drop off. I think right now it would be hard to tell because now you don't know if they're not right. giving because they simply don't have it. Or because they're not That's going. That's true. Right. Mm -hmm. Or because they're not going. But what about the fall off? I mean, I mean the, the financially, this has been very traumatic as well. I, I think the biggest fall off that's a concern is the fall off of people who who stop coming to church. Mm -hmm. uh, I and I know that in my, yeah, so do I. I know people in my own family, people who go to church every single day. And uh, this was a real devastating because they held, uh, what they really believed is, is they believed the church was someone who brought them, brought them closer to God. And their whole sense of, uh, their, their, their sense of faith in the church was deeply shaken. Now, to my mind, that should not be surprising to us, is that, that people in the church are sinners. I mean, that was the way it was in the very beginning of the church. But I think that this was so profound and it was so difficult for many people that they just have not been able to bring themselves uh, to go to church. But you know what? What's, what's, what's fascinating is that all of, all of the studies show that, that that's not a reason that people stop, stop going. It's very strange. I mean, we all know people in our private lives, family, yeah. who say, this is terrible, I'm not going to Mass anymore because of this, because of this, this yeah. terrible scandal. But then if you go into the data, it's not there. Well, What's because the maybe uh, people don't, don't say that the scandal is a cause of their yeah, but but they they falling they away. Yes. Uh, a, a, a bad preaching, or, or it's this kind of like vague, yeah. uh, they don't even. More often than not, it's just somebody ticked me off and I'm right. not going anymore. Yeah, but uh, I have to say, I mean, I've heard it plenty of times where people who have, were very faithful, their faith was deeply shaken. And I, I just don't think we should kind of, you know, we should skirt around it. The, the problem is, is our faith is not in a priest or an institution. Our faith is in Jesus Christ and the sacraments Okay, so for then us, why, do they have to go to, why do they have to go to church then to have their faith? Why can't they because, have their because faith the only way, the Holy the only way that The only way you receive the body and blood of Christ is by going to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And the only way you receive the sacraments of the church is by going to, to, to church on Sunday. So it's a faith in Jesus Christ, but our faith in Jesus Christ is manifest in our reception of Holy Communion. This is the command of Christ, right? To, to eat my body, to drink my blood. I mean, this is, it, it, we are called as Christians to community. That's why what has happened here has been so devastating because it was divisive and it fractured communion and community so much. But it's awfully hard for somebody who may have experienced, had personal experience with a priest, somebody mm -hmm. that they trusted, they respected, that was their spiritual guide to suddenly be the one who's charged with but, abuse. I mean, that's a but, very but, but hard Jane, thing to get over. Sure. I almost think that it would be easier if some focus was put on abuse in other situations because then I think it would help people to see that yes this is a terrible devastating thing but it's not just the priest it's our fathers and our mothers and our teachers and our scoutmasters and if you can get a broader perspective on it then it might be a lot easier for people to look at broken priest bad priest and say 
Humanity is broken. I'm not going to let that keep me from the Holy Eucharist. Well, scandal is always the been imperfect a part, priest is still. Scandal has been always part of the church. I mean, our Lord Himself said, "Better to have a millstone tied around one's neck than to lead one of these little ones astray." Right. So, I mean, I think this was contemplated by our Lord that people who are religious authorities can do terrible damage to people's faith. That has happened in this case. There's no way around it. Hopefully, now we can just be instruments of healing. Final thoughts from you, Grant. I think the Catholic community is still waiting to see whether all of the bishops get it. I mean, there is one bishop who will not cooperate with the John Jay study. There is, there is a, another bishop who hasn't released the priest personnel files that were part of a, a, a very large abuse settlement. So when those things start to happen, I think then a greater sense of trust will, will come from Catholic Lady. But until then, I don't, I don't see it. Elizabeth? I think something bad happens, and it's to your country you love, and your country does something bad. Your parent you love, and your parent does something bad. Your priest you love, he does something bad. You find a way to continue to love through all of that. And it's difficult and, and it's a challenge, but we have to keep doing that. And I'm going to give you one, a couple of seconds for a final thought. Yeah, I just think that we, we have to be is sorry and let people know that we love them and we're sorry and we're gonna try to do better. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your input in discussing this very painful subject and thank you all for watching us and being with us today. And remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We're always on online at netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. We'll see you next time in the arena. <laughs>